so you've established your, your goals for your digital marketing research, and you've thought about what a good target sample would be in order to answer those goals. Now you need to identify the method by which you're going to collect the data about that sample to help you understand those goals, right? Uh, and the method, you know, we can start by asking some traditional questions that you might ask regardless of the marketing research framework you're going to use, whether it be digital or traditional. But, you know, one of those questions might be, am I going to use primary research? In other words, I'm going to go out and collect the data myself or secondary research. I'm going to rely upon other sources. Am I going to use quantitative research where I actually have numbers that I can look at? Or am I going to use qualitative research where we kind of get discussions going about the way uh, that people understand the product and the marketing messaging? And the answer to a lot of these questions often happens to be I'm going to use all of these different things together, right? Uh, but you need to understand the strengths and weaknesses of each when designing your research methods. Once I've gone through that kind of framework and thought about what's going to be most useful for me, then I need to determine the exact form by which I'm going to conduct my digital marketing research. And I kind of break this up into the taking of traditional methods of research and moving them online and or the creation of brand new methods that are really enabled by digital marketing. Right. So traditional methods online include things like surveys and focus groups, which we'll discuss in more detail, but also include things like personal interviews and ethnography, right? And these could be examples where you kind of, for instance, a personal interview could be conducted by Skyping someone, right? And ethnography could be conducted by actually embedding yourself into a forum where people are discussing products um, and and kind of understanding how they're going to need and use those products. For instance, if you're a car manufacturer, maybe you embed yourself in a muscle car forum, understanding how people are talking about muscle cars, the idea to appeal to that community. Um, and then you can also think about research communities. And these were generally, you know, similar to ethnography, right? You would have a community, traditionally you would have a community of groups and you would spend some time kind of analyzing that community. You'd go to conventions that they held, you'd go to meetings that they held and things like that. Here we can facilitate that by creating a place for them to have those conversations in an online format, right? New methods include things like online monitoring. So I can, I can monitor what people are saying about my firm in an online context on a daily basis, right? I can figure out how they're mentioning me on Twitter. Um, I can do listening labs where I have present them with the opportunity to sit down and work with a, a website or a digital product and I give them a goal to achieve and then I listen as they try and achieve that goal, thereby allowing me to figure out how to better alter my messaging and my method and my, my information I'm providing them. And conversion optimization. I can track all those clicks on the apps, on the website, on the social media, and I can figure out when are we losing people who look like they're going to purchase their product or not, right? Now, before I move on, I should mention that just because you're executing a digital marketing plan does not mean that all your market research has to be conducted in a digital mark in a digital context, right? You could, for instance, do a traditional survey, a traditional focus group, and then use that information to influence your digital marketing plan, right? Just because it's going to be digital doesn't mean that every all the research has to be digitally done as well. So let's take a step back and talk about these different aspects. So primary versus secondary digital research. Primary digital research involves identifying consumers online and then reaching out to them for their opinions, right? Secondary digital research involves identifying researches where data was collected about your target sample already for another purpose, but it helps you answer your question. So let's get concrete about this, right? When we're talking about primary research, we're talking about maybe doing something like the survey, like the survey I did at the beginning of this class, right? Or, you know, maybe a focus group, right, where you bring people together and you have them discuss a particular idea or concept or product or messaging that you want them to think about, right? You could also imagine um, a secondary research examples, right? And I've mentioned a couple of these when I talked about resources that I think are vital for you when thinking about digital marketing. And these are things like the Pew Research Center data, right, on American inter internet life, right? So the eight in 10 American shoppers are online shoppers. This was data that was collected for another purpose, but something that you might use in deciding how to best conduct your digital marketing plan. Or eMarketer, one of my favorite ones, right? Uh, you know, looking at product categories for which US internet users like to shop via augmented reality, right? When you're deciding whether or not to include augmented reality in your digital marketing plan, this might be a good kind of resource to look at um, when understanding what's going on there, right? Um, 
of course, besides primary versus secondary, and again, I often think that you want to complement them and use them both together, you want to think about qualitative versus quantitative digital research. So qualitative research is usually done by exploring a topic in depth with a small group of participants, usually in a forum or another long text digital format. Uh, though it could also be via an online chat or internet telephony or a number of different examples, right? The emphasis in qualitative research is on qualitative unstructured insights into what the product and the market should be about. It's good for generating ideas and exploring content. So you can bring people together and say, hey, we want to offer a new audio streaming service. What kind of features would you like in that? And have a discussion about it. You're not trying to figure out what feature, you're not trying to confirm that the features you already have in the product are good features, you're trying to identify new features to include. Quantitative research on the other hand is typically done by asking a larger number of people a smaller number of questions in such a way that the data can be summarized, right? So the example here would be, we're offering a new digital streaming service, we want to include uh, exclus exclusive artists who are not available on other, on other streaming services. Would that be valuable to you? Please rate this on a scale of one to seven. Right? That's an example of a quantitative research question. It's a confirmatory hypothesis question, right? Where you're trying to confirm a hypothesis that might have been developed through another method. Quantitative research is very good for identifying and confirming ideas and narrowing down solutions, not necessarily for generating ideas. That being said, the distinction between these two is blurring as always in the digital space, right? If I conduct qualitative research, I could go out, for instance, and collect a bunch of Twitter data about what people have said about my brand, right? That seems like qualitative research because it's long form text data. But what if I then look at all the tweets that only talk about a certain product feature and then classify them by sentiment? Now I have a quantitative number about that qualitative data, right? And so this line is kind of blurring, but you kind of get some ideas as to how, what the difference of these are and how they can be used differently. As an example of qualitative and quantitative data, for instance, um, there's a company called Tremor that does a great job of putting together communities of highly engaged consumers who um, have influential ideas. And they market this as an influential influencer marketing program, but they're also using the data that's generated by these users to understand the market and what goes on there. So they have one that's called Vocal Point that's very famous, came out of uh, Procter & Gamble group at one point. In fact, Tremor came out of Procter & Gamble. And that's a community of highly engaged, connected, influential women who are used in this context to kind of as an online focus group to study what their reactions to various products are. On the quantitative side, right, you could do something like the Google Forms we looked at, or Google actually makes available something called Google Consumer Surveys or Google Surveys, where you can actually target a specific group of American consumers or, um, or worldwide consumers to take a survey about a particular brand or aspect that might happen. And of course, you know, that gets into the general question of all the different kinds of online surveys that are out there. And there are a number of different ways you can put together an online survey that you could use when doing your digital marketing research. And I've listed a couple here. SurveyMonkey, of course, uh, Google Forms, which is uh, the one that we talked about earlier and what you use for the survey, what I use for my surveys in class. Google Consumer Surveys, which we just discussed, where you can pay 10 cents response or something like that, depending upon how much the target market you're looking at is. And then Amazon Mechanical Turk, and Amazon Mechanical Turk is often used in these contexts, um, though, uh, to, to pay people to fill out consumer surveys, though you must be aware that the, the, the group that's involved in this is a little biased, right? That they are a certain, there's a certain population who is likely to be on Mechanical Turk. And for those of you who have never heard of Mechanical Turk, it's essentially a, a, a site on Amazon, a part of Amazon, where I can go on and I can say, here's a task I want people to complete. And it could be a task like filling out a brand survey. And Amazon will send that survey out to a bunch of people. And after they've completed it, I can then pay them for their results, depending on how well they qualify, how well they finish the results. Now it's important when you're designing these online surveys to think about what, how you're going to do them. And now they support almost any question type, open-ended, closed end, closed question, right? So you can have a text box, you can have a specific yes or no, you can do a ranked ordinal, like what is your big, most fa your favorite, what is your least favorite, right? Um, uh, or you know, how do you do you agree with the statement on a scale of one to seven, etc. The shorter, the better, you know, no more than five to seven minutes is kind of the general rule of thumb, especially when you're talking to consumers you already have and you're not paying them in any way. 
you should pre-test the survey, right? In other words, have some friends of yours take it or have some colleagues take it just to make sure that, they, that no, the other people see the value of it and see what, how they answer the question. You wanna limit the number of open-ended questions, but at the same time, I think it's vital to include them because some consumers are just gonna go off and give you a bunch of information, right? About what they're thinking. Um, that being said, I often mark the open-ended questions as not being required so that they have the ability to skip over them. Um, send more than one invitation. So if someone purchased a product and you want to do a survey of them and they don't respond right away, send it again, but don't spam them. You know, you got to watch that fine line of kind of sending maybe a couple invitations, but not sending to it constantly. And you should think about providing an incentive. Now, the problem with incentives is that you're going to get a biased sample. Now, you're going to get a biased sample regardless, but you're going to get a biased sample of people who probably have more time, more availability in order to do these things for a particular goal that they're trying to achieve, right? Or a particular trying to achieve the incentive, right? Of course, you can also do online focus groups, right? Where you bring together people online. This is often useful for new products or marketing campaigns. Uh, can also help you understand how to improve your own campaigns and can help you garner insights into new directions. And the way this is typically done is potentially having like a, a large teleconference or a forum of some sort where people are presented with questions. Online monitoring. So this is a new aspect that we talked about. And this is where you just listen to what is being said about your firm, your competitors, and your consumers. You can mine Twitter for conversations. You can look at reviews on Amazon. You can visit online discussion forums where people are talking about things. And there are a bunch of tools out there that exist for online monitoring. And we'll get into these in more detail when we talk about the different channels later on. But things like Hootsuite, Brandwatch, Crimson Hexagon, uh, Google Alerts, and Google Alerts is a free one. You can just have an email sent to you every day when someone mentions your brand, right? But you should also look at your own data, right? How do people find your website? Where do they go once they get there, right? All these are kind of examples of online monitoring that really help you understand and maybe answer some of your research questions. You could consider also developing your own online research communities or using one that's already out there. Now we mentioned Tremor already, but another great one that existed for a while was a blogging community uh, started at GM called Fastlane, which started by uh, their CEO Lutz um, and, and did a lot. Of, and, and so the CEO would post his own blog posts, I don't know, he's proofread blog posts on these, uh, this forum for people to respond to and answer. And that developed a kind of research community that GM could then tap into for insights into their own most loyal consumers, right? Now this was discontinued in 2015, uh, but it did uh, you know, provide some very interesting insights for GM along the way. So once you've done all this, you've collected all this data, you've got all these great reams and reams of insights into what your consumers are doing, you need to not just leave it at that, you need to take all that data from the various research methods and analyze them individually, avoid presupposing what the results are gonna tell you, and then try and synthesize those results together. Once you've synthesized them all, then you can report out. You can translate the analysis of that results into actual insights. What does this tell you about how you should change the firm? What does this tell you about how you should design your digital marketing plan, right? Um, how should you look at a, a digital marketing plan given the knowledge that you have? Before you can go anywhere, before you can take any actions, you should first figure out what, where you are. And that's what market research is all about.